Well, welcome to today's webinar on skilled nursing facility documentation. My name again is Mary Sue Gardner, and I'm going to be your presenter for today's call in which we talk about skilled nursing facility documentation. If you are following along in the slide deck, um, the next thing I'm showing is our disclaimer. And basically our disclaimer said, you know, we prepared this education with the most current Medicare law, laws, rules, and regulations in place. So, so if those laws, rules, and regulations should happen to change, it's your responsibility as a provider to make sure you're following the current laws, rules, and regulations at the time. Um, also, CMS prohibits recording of this presentation for profit-making purposes, but we are recording it for you today. These are some acronyms that um, I will probably say in the course of this event. So if I happen to use an acronym that you're not familiar with, you can refer back to this slide um, for that acronyms list. All right, the objective, the agenda for today. The objective of this skilled nursing facility webinar on documentation requirements is to provide healthcare professionals with comprehensive understanding of the essential documentation process and the regulations specific to skilled nursing facilities. So by the end of this webinar, Participants should be equipped with the knowledge and tools necessary to improve their documentation practices. Also enhance patient care, ensure compliance with legal and regulatory standards, and mitigate potential risks associated with incomplete or inaccurate documentation. So as we move on, and if you're following along with the slide deck, we are on the slide that starts with extended care services. So the term extended care services means the following items and services are furnished to an inpatient of a skilled nursing facility, either directly or under arrangement. So this list includes nursing care provided by or under the supervision of a registered professional nurse, the bed and board in connection with furnishing such nursing care, physical or occupational or speech language or all of them, speech language pathology services furnished by the skilled nursing facility or by others under arrangements made by the facility. And we'll talk about that in a little bit too. Medical social services, drugs, biologicals, supplies, um, appliances, equipment, that is all included in the inpatient care. Medical services provided by an intern or a resident in training of a hospital with which the facility has an effect um, or transfer agreement. I did see real quick, and excuse me, oops. If I could have one of my colleagues um, put the link to the live events page for the handouts in the chat, that would be great. I did see that someone had a question on that. Okay, and then um, again, other services that are necessary to the health of the patient um, that are generally provided by the skilled nursing facility or by others under arrangement. So these, there's general requirements for skilled nursing facility services. In order to provide the services that we talked about on that prior slide, the services must meet some general requirements. So post-hospital extended care services furnished to an inpatient of a skilled nursing facility or a swing bed hospital are covered under the hospital insurance program. The beneficiary must have been an inpatient of a hospital and have a medically necessary stay of at least three consecutive calendar days. 
time spent in observation or in emergency room prior to or in lieu of an inpatient admission to the hospital doesn't count towards that three-day qualifying inpatient hospital stay um, because those services are not considered inpatient. So for the purpose of SNF benefits, qualifying hospital stay requirements, the inpatient status commences with the calendar day of the hospital admission. Um, the, the day of discharge doesn't count. So the easiest way to think of this is three midnights. Did that patient have three midnights in a hospital bed in an acute stay in a hospital bed? Beneficiaries must also require skilled nursing facility cares for the condition that was treated during that hospital stay or for condition that arose while in the SNF for treatment of a condition for which the beneficiary was previously in the hospital. So I hosted a webinar on August 22nd specifically on the coverage criteria for SNF care. And if you were not able to attend that event and you would like further review of the coverage criteria, I encourage you to watch the encore of that event from our YouTube page. And I can go ahead and place a copy of the link to that video in our chat. Give me just a second. So if you're interested, you can, you know, just use that, copy that chat or that chat link and save it for, you know, a later date and time. So why do we talk a little bit about these coverage criteria before we get into some of the general documentation requirements? And you got to excuse me, my computer is not playing nice today. Okay, since um, general documentation requirements must be met in order to meet coverage criteria, any review entity, we're going to specifically be looking for the documentation to support all of these requirements. So when we review for qualifying stay, we're going to look at the records that are received from the hospital stay to support that patient was actually in an inpatient in a hospital for at least three midnight, you know, at that qualifying hospital. And remember, the day the person was admitted counts towards the three days or three midnights, but the day of discharge doesn't count. So that's basically why I say it's easier just to go by the three midnights. Think of it that way. When we look for other information, like the 30-day transfer, we again look at the hospital information that was provided that supports when the patient was discharged from the acute stay. In determining the 30-day transfer period, again, the day of discharge from the hospital is not counted in the 30 days. So for example, if a patient discharges from a hospital on August 1st and is admitted to the skilled nursing facility on August 31st, then they're within that 30-day transfer. So the 30-day period begins on the day following the actual discharge from the hospital, and that continues until the individual is admitted to a participating skilled nursing facility and requires and receives a covered level of care. That's an individual who is admitted to a SNF within 30 calendar days after discharge from a hospital, but does not require a covered level of care until more than 30 days after such discharge, does not meet that 30-day requirement. But there is an exception to this rule. And finally, when we're looking at documentation, we're looking at some of the conditions of coverage and the coverage requirements. And we have to look to make sure that those are being met. Um, so we're looking to make sure that the patient is being treated for a condition that was in the hospital or that arose from 
the re, you know, arose in the SNF for a condition that was being treated for in the hospital. And, and all of this is important because when we talk about documentation, it's not always just specific components of documentation. Your documentation that you have to support the coverage criteria may be located in pieces of actual documentation that I say are necessary, but maybe your facility calls them something different. So in order to support your services as being medically reasonable and necessary, your documentation as a whole needs to not only have the components that we talked about, but give us any of the components that support those coverage criteria as well. So as we move on, we're gonna talk about level of care. So if you're following along in the, uh, with the slide deck, we're on the slide that starts with level of care. So care in a skilled nursing facility is covered if all the following factors are met. The patient needs to require skilled nursing services or skilled rehab services or combination of both. Um, those services must be performed by or under the supervision of a, of a professional or technical personnel, are covered by a physician, physician, <clears throat> excuse me, and the services are rendered, again, for a condition which the patient received the hospital care or that arose while part of the hospital, or arose from the hospital services. So the patient needs to require these services on a daily basis. So a daily basis for therapy, PTOT and SLP is five days a week. A daily requirement for nursing is every day, is seven days a week. The patient needs to require these skills again on a daily basis and as a practical matter, considering economy and efficiency, the daily skilled services can be provided only on an inpatient basis in a skilled facility. So it requires inpatient level of care. The services need to be delivered and reasonable and necessary for that per patient's illness or injury or whatever brought them to the skilled nursing facility. Again, there has to be a need for the services. They need to need your license, your skills, your professional licensing to render that services. And, and when we talk about services, you know, needing to be medically reasonable and necessary, those are the things that you should think about. If you are a clinician, why does it need me, my license, my clinical education for this patient to get better, for this patient to hopefully go home um, after being discharged from the skilled nursing facility? If any of these factors aren't met, a stay in a skilled nursing facility, even though some of these may have been rendered, may not be covered. So for example, payment for a skilled nursing facility level of care could not be made if a patient doesn't um, meet the daily skilled need. So if they're there and they're getting, let's just use one of the therapies, they're getting physical therapy three times a week, but there's no other like daily nursing services, et cetera, that person doesn't require the level of care of an inpatient. So how do you document level of care? In reviewing claims for skilled nursing facility services to determine whether the level of care requirements are met, we as your AB MAC, First, consider whether a patient needs a skilled care. If the need for the skilled care does not exist, then the daily and practical matter requirements are really not addressed um, and not met. 
so again, we kind of went over this uh, on the last slide. How do you support it? You show us on paper what you're doing that requires your license, your education on a daily basis. And again, for therapy, PTOT and SLP, that is five days a week. For nursing, that is seven days a week. And if it is a restorative program, that needs to be rendered on at least six days a week. Coverage of nursing and or therapy um, to perform a maintenance program does not turn on the absence or presence of the individual's potential for improvement. So I just wanted to, to make sure that I put that out there, but it rather it's on the beneficiary's need for that skilled care. So eligibility for SNF Medicare A coverage hasn't changed with the, you know, with like PPS or anything. Those, those coverage requirements still exist. And the part that is important for you to understand as a clinician or important for you to understand when billing for your clinicians is the documentation really needs to support that these services are necessary for the patient and these services are being rendered supporting these daily requirements. And if they're not, and you can't find it in your documentation, then chances are we can't find it in your documentation either, and we probably won't pay for the services. So let's talk about what types of services are skilled or how skilled services are defined. Skilled nursing and skilled rehab services are those services that are furnished per certain, <laughs> oh my goodness, tongue tied today, um, per certain to a physician order. Blah, I don't know why that was such a mouthful today. Okay, so they require the skills of the qualified technical or professional health professional, such as the registered nurse, the licensed practical or vocational nurse, physical, occupational, speech language pathologist, um, and audiologist. And they need to be provided directly by or under the general supervision of these skilled professionals. So these skilled personnel that you have in place. And this needs to be done to assure the safety of the patient and, and to make sure you are achieving the medically desired results. Note that general supervision requires uh, initial direction and periodic inspection of the actual activity. However, the supervisor need not always be physically present or on the premises when the assistant is performing the services. Skilled care may be necessary to improve a patient's current condition, to maintain the patient's current condition, or to prevent or slow further deterioration of that patient's condition. So what principles are used to determine skilled services? If the inherent complexity of the service prescribed for the patient is such that it can be performed safely and effectively only by you or under your general supervision, if you're the skilled nurse or rehab personnel, then that service could be considered a skilled service. The administration of IV feedings, IM injections, the insertion of a suprapubic catheter, ultrasound, short wave, microwave therapy treatments, those are all considered skilled that need to be done by the skilled professional. We as your MAC consider the nature of the service and the skills required 
for it to be safe and effective in its delivery. And we use that to decide whether your service is skilled or not skilled. So while a patient's particular medical condition is a valid factor in deciding if skilled services are needed, a patient's diagnosis or prognosis shouldn't be your sole factor in um, saying that this person is a skilled patient or, or needs skilled services. So uh, diagnosis alone does not mean that the person needs skilled services. An example of that, you can consider me. I have MS, multiple sclerosis, but I don't need skilled therapy at this time. So my diagnosis doesn't define me. My diagnosis doesn't mean I need skilled services at this time. My diagnosis could be a contributing factor to why one day I may need skilled nursing services, but at this time it, it doesn't. So I hope that helps to better helps to better understand that. Okay, documentation to support skilled claims is the slide that we're on if you're following along with the slide deck. So claims for skilled care coverage need to include a sufficient amount of documentation to enable that reviewer to determine whether skilled involvement is required um, in order for those skilled services in question to be furnished safely and effectively. The services themselves are in fact reasonable and necessary for the patient's illness or injury or the condition that brought them to your, your place of service. The documentation must also show that the services are appropriate in terms of duration and quantity and overall treatment. So we want those services to be performed to promote reaching patients reaching their therapeutic goals. So it's expected that the documentation in the patient's medical record will reflect the need for skilled, the skilled services provided. The patient's medical record is also expected to provide important communication among all team members. So that's one other thing that we look for in your documentation. Um, if you are seeing differences in how a patient is responding in therapy versus how they are responding for nursing, we would hope that there would be some documentation in your overall documentation to explain those differences or explain what the other entity should be doing. And I'll give an example, and this is one we've seen in the past before, um, and we still continue to see it. Therapy is documenting that the patient is able to walk 150 foot with a standby assist, that, you know, they have a, a, a unsteady gait, but they're using their assistive device appropriately. Um, while nursing's reporting the same patient as a two-person transfer assist that the patient is not able to ambulate more than 50 foot without an assisted device and, you know, that two-person assist. Then we start wondering, well, whose documentation is correct? Or where is, you know, what's accounting for the differences? Well, it could be that during the day, the patient does very well with therapy because physical therapy is the expert on the ambulation. But when that person is at the end of the day and with nursing staff, their gait is no longer good, they're weak, their pain is, you know, at a higher level than it was before and they can't do those transfers that they're able to do with, with the therapy staff. So that's one place where we would say if there's differences that we want to see 
there's rationale explaining the need for those differences and why things aren't as they seem. So again, um, you know, we take all of your documentation into account when we do a claim review. And on your screen and what's on your slide here are some of the basic components of documentation that we look to to make sure that all of these things are included. So the physician's H&P, any skilled services that are provided and who they are provided by. The patient's response to that skilled care. Again, and if they're not responding well with nursing and they're responding well with um, therapy, then why is there a difference between what therapy is reporting and what nursing maybe could be doing for follow through from therapy? Maybe that's adjusting medication regimes. Any plans for future care, where the patient is going to go when they discharge from your facility? We also need detailed rationale explaining the need for the skilled services. So not just the patient needs PT or OT, but what do they need and why did they need it? That usually comes in the form of the physician's um, certification for need and recertification for continuing need. Complexity of the services to be performed, we're going to look to the individual personnel that are involved in this patient's care. So if it's PT, we're going to look at the PT and evaluation and their overall plan of care for what they plan to do. OT, SLP, um, prosthetics, orthotics, et cetera and nursing. And then any other pertinent characteristics of the beneficiary. Is there anything that makes this beneficiary more complex? Uh, did this patient have a prior stroke and has, has prior right-sided weakness and now they have a, have just had a left hip replacement, so now we have a whole, you know, another unique set of circumstances uh, involving this beneficiary and how um, they may or may not progress or what we may or may not need to do. So specific components, again, of documentation um, need to be all the nursing notes, all the therapy notes, anything your physician documents on. We need to have the information from the hospital so that could be in the form of hospital discharge summaries or some sort of information that was sent either by the hospital or that the nursing facility has developed to provide that overall care um, that happened in the hospital. When the patient was admitted, when they were discharged, you usually get a list of medications that they were on, any continued need, et cetera. Any social work documentation or case management where they're working on getting the patient. Social work and case management usually always have plans of care as well, so that needs to be included. Dietary information, nutritional needs of the patient, and then of course your MDS. All right, now let's move on and talk about some um, specific examples of skilled nursing and skilled rehab. So the development and, man and development management and evaluation of a care plan based on the physician order and supporting documentation really constitute skilled nursing services when in terms of the patient's physical or mental condition, these services require the involvement of the skilled personnel to meet these patients' needs and to promote recovery and ensure that the patient is safe and, and medically safe. However, the planning and management of a treatment plan that does not involve the furnishing of skilled services may not require skilled personnel. So, you know, you have to consider what is going into, what is going into it. Generally, under all of 
nursing and rehab, when you are developing an evaluation, a plan of care, deciding what the care needs are of the patient, those are types of things that can only be formulated by you with your license, your skills. Someone under you cannot develop and manage your overall evaluation of the patient. But in the process of developing that and thinking about the management of the patient, if the management doesn't include um, your license or your uh, assigning of duties to, to carry out skilled services, then you might not have a skilled patient. Observation and assessment of the patient's condition. Again, this is when you're formulating and thinking about your plan and your overall care. Does it require you and your license to observe this patient, to assess their needs, to make changes to the plan of care if you are seeing something that is not working for your beneficiary? or if you see that additional services need to be added for your beneficiary. Teaching and training activities. Teaching and training usually require your skills as a licensed therapist, as a registered nurse, um, to develop what is going to be taught and to train the patient on what activities need to be done. Now, there can be some teaching and training that are done by your non-skilled personnel or, or your um, non-licensed personnel, um, your assistants, your CNAs, your therapy assistants, but, um, you know, the initial development and that teaching and training activity need to be developed by you. And then there's some questionable situations that also arise that um, can be considered um, skilled. And if those were to come into play, um, you know, I, I'm drawing a blank for um, an example right now, but if you have questionable situations, it doesn't mean that they're not skilled. It means that you really need to support what services need to be provided to that patient and show us why it requires the skills of those licensed personnel. Um, some specific things in nursing that I, I'm just going to hit on that are generally always considered skilled services. IV or intravenous or IM injections um, or intravenous feedings. Those are considered skilled. Parenteral or enteral feedings that um, comprise at least 26% of the daily caloric requirements and at least 501 milliliters of fluid per day. So this is a very specific requirement. If this patient falls, if you have a patient that's on an enteral or parenteral feeding and they b fall below these parameters, maybe they just get that feeding once a day, that's no longer considered skilled. Um, nasopharyngeal and tracheotomy aspirations, those are considered skilled services. Insertion, sterile irrigation, replacement of suprapubic catheters, those are always considered skilled. And the application of dressings involving prescription medications, aseptic techniques, sterile techniques, those are considered skilled too. Again, these are some of the services that we would consider skill if they're rendered on a daily basis. And again, when it comes to those feedings, there's specific parameters involving that. So decubitus ulcers, if they're stage three or worse, or a widespread skin disorder, heat treatments that are ordered by a physician as part of an active treatment, which require observation to evaluate progress. And this just isn't like, 
heating pads or putting a hot pack on during therapy. Rehab nursing procedures, that includes like a related teaching and adaptive aspects of those. Those are um, considered skilled. The initial phases of medical gas regime, so when they're first starting on, on medical gas um, or bronchodilator therapy, and, and even the care of a colostomy or ostomy during the early post-operative period. Once the ostomy is healed and old and doesn't require those daily acute skills, that is no longer considered a um, a skilled service. So what are we going to look for in the nursing notes? What documentation do we look for this information? We look in your admission assessments. We look in your daily nursing notes. We look in any flow sheet that a nurse documents on. We look to your plan of care. Um, if you are doing any kind of nursing rehab, we're going to look to those notes. Any like vital sign records, any MARS or medication administration records or IV administration records, any treatment sheets, and any documented activities of daily living. So basically, if a nurse documents on it, then it should be submitted for review. And this is especially important to remember when a patient's in a skilled nursing facility any and all documentation from the nursing staff will be considered upon review to support that skilled level that is billed. So when we look at therapy and the daily skilled services of a therapist, um, therapy services are considered skilled when they are so inherently complex that they can only safely and effectively be performed only by or under the supervision of that qualified therapist. And those are CMS's direct words on that. These skilled services may be necessary to improve a patient's current condition or to maintain the patient's current condition in an event to prevent or slow, you know, further deterioration of a patient's condition. So remember, in order for therapy services to be considered skilled, the services must be directly and specifically related to an active written treatment plan that usually written by the qualified therapist and that is shared with the physician as well. Again, the therapy services need to be at a level of complexity and sophistication or the condition that the patient, um, the patient has, the nature of that, it requires that professional judgment and knowledge and skills of that qualified therapist. Again, that information must be shared with the physician that is in charge of this patient and included as part of that physician's overall certification. So the services must be considered under acceptable standards of medical practice as well. And they need to be specific and effective treatment for the patient's condition. They have to be reasonable and necessary. Um, and we also need to make sure that the amount, frequency, and duration for your patient is reasonable and necessary as well. So as we look at some of the therapy documentation, and this includes PT, OT, and speech language pathology, the pieces of documentation that we're going to look at are the initial evaluation and plan of care. We're going to specifically be looking for prior and current levels of function. And we're going to make sure, or we want to make sure, your prior and current levels of function are written in an objective and measurable terms. So anytime as a therapist, even as a nurse, you can document in ways that give us 
objective and measurable terms, percentages, weight, degrees, amounts. It is only going to behoove you to document in that matter because we can, we can see then from progress note to progress note that what you're doing is helping that patient, you know, make effective gains um, if we have objective and measurable information to go by. Also in your therapy documentation, things that we're going to look at, a plan of care with the goals. We're going to look really hard at your progress notes because that is where you as the licensed therapist have to document. You have to document those progress notes at least every 10th treatment day or before if your facility wants you to do it before. Um, but progress notes need to be done specifically by you, as does the initial evaluation and any necessary reevaluations. <clears throat> um, and then your daily treatment records. And your daily treatment records can be documented by your therapy assistant, but um, your progress notes, your plan of care, your initial evaluation, those need to be done with you. Those are you, when you are showing us what you're doing for that patient, what you're changing, what you're considering within their documentation to help them, you know, hopefully move out of the skilled realm and either the goal, hopefully, is to go back home or home with assistance. So in the treatment records, they can be treatment grids, treatment logs, but they all have to have actual treatment minutes documented. And then there's the physician, and we look at the physician documentation as well. And specific things that we look for from the physician are the admission records. And that admission record needs to include any diagnoses that this patient has. Um, it's important that the physician is capturing that so your MDS coordinators can appropriately capture everything in the MDS to maximize the reimbursement. So if you're not getting the correct diagnoses from your physician, it, it may result in a lesser payment when you do your MDS. So make sure you are seeking that information directly from the physician and you are obtaining those diagnoses from the condition or from the physician. We're going to look for what conditions that the physician is saying that this person needs the skilled care for. And this information, we're going to also look for history and physical from that physician. We're going to look for all physician orders. We're going to look at the physician's progress notes and their overall plan of care, too. Other things that are specific to the physician to document is the certification and recertification. And those need to be done during specific time frames. So there needs to be certification done upon admission to the facility. And that physician needs to follow the recertification time frames that are required for skilled nursing facilities. And then finally, evaluation of diagnostic tests that are ordered. So if, if a physician orders diagnostic tests or any kind of interventions, then that physician should also be documenting the results of those tests and how that affects the treatment of the patient. If they are lab results and the lab results yielded something like high blood glucose and this patient perhaps needs to be on insulin now, then we would be looking that the physician was making a plan for the nursing staff to carry out on insulin administration. Perhaps the results didn't yield anything, and it's just going to continue to monitor the patient for whatever, you know, signs or symptoms this patient has. So maybe they ran a urinalysis thinking that this patient might have a UA or a UTI, and the results came back negative, and there was no UTI present. Um, so we're going to continue to evaluate the patient, you know, 
on a daily basis for whatever kind of, let's say they were having some mental health changes or, or something seemed off with them that led them to believe maybe this patient possibly had a UTI. But again, that's part of the physician's overall plan of care and evaluation of diagnostic tests. Anytime a physician orders something, there should be follow-up. There should be follow-up either in adding it to our plan or follow-up that says no further treatment or no further action is necessary or continue to monitor, et cetera. And finally, other components of documentation. So these are just other places that we look to in your medical record to support your services that you're providing are medically reasonable and necessary, provided on a daily basis, and provided by the correct people. So we're gonna look for the acute care discharge summary or transfer records. We kinda of already talked about that. We also look at nurse or social services or case management documentation, where they're hoping to um, help the patient get to what kind of outside services need to be considered in order for this patient to go home, et cetera. Nutrition and dietary records. Uh, again, most of these services, uh, social services, case management, nutrition, dietary, they also develop plans of care. So what are we hoping to accomplish? What are we doing for our patient? What are we developing in our plan of care? If it's nutrition and dietary based, what have we done to provide, let's say, thickened liquids, et cetera, to meet the patient's ordered dietary needs? We also look at diagnostic records, if there's any radiology, laboratory, any of those kind of services, as well as your MDSs. And most importantly, when we are reviewing your documentation to support that the services are medically reasonable and necessary and they support the level that you submitted that you want to be paid for, so they support that um, payment code, we also have to look at the look back information. So there is times that the information to support the service that you got the level by doing your MDS is oftentimes in that look back information, which could be into the hospital time frame. So if you're going to code for it, it needs to be included. So if it was supported IV administration in the look back time frame, that IV administration of medications may have happened at the acute care hospital. You need to make sure that you have some sort of record from that acute hospital stay to support that information that you used in your MDS to get the billing code that you are sending us. All right. Just a few documentation tips is what I want to end with before we take any questions and answers. So I just want to remind you, identify that need to observe or assess any high risk situations that um, may be present. Make sure you incorporate any goals, objectives, planned interventions and outcomes. Um, make sure you include any documentation that supports the need for skilled services and you submit that if, if we ask for it in medical review. And really also I should add on here, make sure anytime you can, you are documenting in objective and measurable terms. That is again only going to help support your documentation. So if you considered it, suspected it, reviewed it, were concerned about it, thought about it, monitor it, document it. It, it again, was only going to benefit you. Please take a few minutes um, now or before the end of this webinar to complete our survey. Tell us what you'd like, 
what um, you want more of, what we can do better. And our survey actually has an opportunity for you to tell us what other topics that you want for future education. So your feedback is really invaluable to ensuring that um, we do education for you and that's timely and effective. So I'm gonna take one last look over at the chat. I do not see anything that has come in. So on behalf of myself and all of Provider Outreach and Education, as well as Medical Review, I wanna thank you for your participation in this event. We look forward to your survey comments and um, remember coming later this month, there is actually a webinar on some of the common PDPM mistakes. So you might want to go to our live event page and sign up for that as well. But again, thank you for your participation in today's event and you may now disconnect.